So now for my most important duty of the evening. I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing our distinguished lecturer, Mr. Gilbert Ledresse. Gil Ledresse began working at the Co-op Refinery Complex in Regina as a process utility operator in 1979. For the next decade, he demonstrated the drive and commitment that has characterized his career by taking a series of leaves to pursue his post-secondary education. All that hard work paid off when Gill graduated from the U of S with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering in 1989. Today, he is the Vice President of Refinery Operations at the Co-op Refinery Complex in Regina. His story is all about the strength of our province of Saskatchewan, where a world-class education, career, and lifestyle are all possible. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished lecturer, Mr. Gilbert Ledresse. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying what a great, and I have to say, unexpected honor it is for me to be asked to speak here tonight. I remember when the university first called, they asked, Gil, would you mind participating in the C.J. McKenzie Gala? And my reaction right away was, sure, I'd be happy to buy some tickets. <laughs> then they explained, uh, no, Gil, we want you to be the keynote speaker. And then, well, let's just say there was a long, stunned silence. You know, when I look at the great accomplishments of the past distinguished lect lecturers, it made me feel like I was on an episode of Sesame Street. You know where they sing, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> I am very grateful to the College of Engineering for this honor and, and for providing me the foundation for my career. But before we go any further, I would like to give a quick shout out to, my, to the person on whom my success has most depended my wife. Now, I remember seeing a clip from an award show, it was a few years back, where this big celebrity, I think his name was uh, Christian Bale, was in the middle of his acceptance speech and he forgets his wife's name. <laughs> now, I don't care how big a celebrity you are, if something like that happens, you're sleeping on the couch that night. So, Debbie, <laughs> I just want to say I love you. And Debbie, I appreciate all the support you've given me throughout the years. The focus of our evening tonight, the whole theme of the C.J. McKenzie Gala is mentoring, coaching that next generation of engineers to strive for excellence in their profession. As I look around the room tonight, I'm very encouraged to see all the engineering students and engineers in training joining us here tonight. Those of us who have been in the profession for a while can easily see in them the same sorts of hopes and fears that we all had when we were starting out. The hope for each of us, of course, is that we turn out to be an engineer like Tony Stark from Iron Man movies. <laughs> but of course, the fear is that we're more likely to turn out to be one of the characters from the Big Bang Theory. I think it's pretty obvious how I turned out. <laughs> Seriously, I don't pretend to be a particularly great or exceptional engineer, but I have learned a few things along the way about being the best you can be in this profession. Also, working for the co-op refinery, I've learned a number of things about the opportunities and potential to succeed as an engineer 
right here in Saskatchewan. So I would like to talk to you about that as well. For starters, I'd like to tell you a bit about my own path to becoming an engineer, since I came into the profession from a somewhat different path. I know for many of you students here today, you were in a certain sense almost born to this profession. Many of your parents were engineers, or perhaps you had an uncle or another relative that inspired you. So from the time you left high school, there probably wasn't much doubt in your mind that you were going to become an engineer someday. I came at it from a different direction. I started off at the bottom. I worked as a junior operator at the refinery. I worked my way up the ranks of some of the skilled positions, and then I finally felt that it was time to look for something else. I tried out computer science for a bit. I didn't like it. So I shifted over to engineering, and that just seemed like a natural fit for me. Although that's not to say that it was easy. Now, at this point, I'm going to start sounding like a Monty Python character. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Monty Python sketch, the one where the rich old men all sit around trying to outdo each other with these outlandish stories about how tough they had it when they were young. And I know you students here today, you work very hard on your studies, and many of you may often not have much time for a social life or other activities but I consider that luxury. <laughs> my employer was very supportive of my ambitions to become an engineer, but of course, they still expected me to do my job, and I still had a family to support. So I took leaves of absences, and sometimes I took classes while at work. I did a lot of switching of shifts with my coworkers, so between classes and night shifts, I was away from home more often than I would have liked. But by and by, I made it through. And as you can imagine today, I wear my iron ring with great pride. The path I took to becoming an engineer was a tough one, but I also feel very lucky to have come up that road. And this has given me perspectives on my profession that I don't think I would have had otherwise. I have seen engineers and engineering work from many angles. I've seen engineers as my bosses. I've been a boss myself. And I've worked shoulder to shoulder with other disciplines of engineering as my peers. Each of these perspectives has taught me something very important. Perhaps the most important thing my experience has taught me the quality most important for engineering excellence, the one quality that we see in all truly great engineers is humility. You know, sometimes doctors get a bad rap. People sometimes think they are arrogant or what have you. But engineers aren't like that. We can't afford to be like that. We can never allow ourselves to think that we know it all or that we have nothing left to learn, because that's when mistakes happen. They say that the most powerful wisdom in the world is not only to know what you know, but to also know what you don't know. I have learned that many times throughout my career, how true that really is. Working at the refinery, where there are so many types of expertise involved, I've long since learned that you need to put your trust in the subject matter expert. And depending on the situation, that expert may be someone who you might think is beneath you in the professional or corporate ladder. That expert might be a junior engineer, a technician, or a skilled tradesperson. A good way to think about it is in terms of an aircraft carrier, the officer, the fighter pilot, may want to land his jet, 
But if that ensign who is in charge of the flight deck tells him it's not safe to land, then he's not allowed to land. I had the experience a few times in my career when I was a junior operator. And I would radio in into one of the senior operators to report an equipment malfunction. And they would radio back, well, make the call. This is a call to shut down. Can you imagine, as one of the lowest ranking employees of the operation, being delegated that authority to shut down part of this multi-million dollar operation? The expression, fill your boots, well, it was pretty much invented for a situation like that. Even after I'd become an engineer, I had to learn the lesson from time to time about conceding to other kinds of expertise. This one time, when I was a young superintendent, we had a serious coke blockage at the refinery. Now, at the refinery, we usually deal with coke blockages the same way that you deal with them at your workplace. We jiggle that coin return, then we nudge the, coin, the, the coke machine until that can of coke falls down. <laughs> but this time, it was a different kind of coke. The kind of coke that comes from petroleum. And the blockage involved an accumulation of that coke inside one of our heaters, in the heater tubes, which can become a very serious safety hazard. The problem was trying to find out exactly where that blockage was so that we could deal with it. A number of us in the engineering staff, including the chemical engineers, put our heads together. We did pressure surveys, x-ray inspections, all were ineffective. We decided it was pretty much hopeless. We would just have to take a saw to the heater tube assembly, start in the middle of the heater tubes, and systematically keep cutting until we found the blockage. No other way, we thought. Then a couple of young mechanical engineers chimed in and said, hey, let us give it a try. So we did. And in a short time, they found the exact area of the blockage. Instead of ripping up our whole heater assembly, we made just one cut on a little segment of pipe and replaced it. How did they do it? It would almost make you cry. It was so simple. They tapped the pipe. <laughs> just like finding a stud in a wall. Ding, 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 dunk. Oh, I guess that's where the blockage is. <laughs> so, you see, even amongst us engineers, there are things that will seem obvious to engineers in one scope of practice that won't occur to others. So we must always be prepared to concede to other people's expertise. But I don't think I need to go on too long about humility as a quality in engineering excellence. I think for most of us in this profession, that's, that quality just seems to come naturally. And it's because of that, because of our natural humility, thoroughness, and cautiousness that we have earned what I view as the second most important quality in engineering excellence, public trust. I don't know how many of you were at the APEGS annual meeting. It was a couple of years ago. But they had a presentation about polling that had been done about public attitudes in Saskatchewan towards engineers. The results were impressive. And they lined up with polls I've heard about from other provinces. About 85% of the general public have a positive attitude towards the engineering profession. That is off the charts. That's almost higher than any other profession. That level of trust does not happen by accident, nor should it be taken for granted. At the refinery, we're always mindful of something that every engineer should remember, the importance 
of social license. The public gives us permission to undertake these massive, complex projects, whether that's a bridge, a refinery, a mine, or an electrical network, because they trust us, the engineers, to do the right thing and to ensure that everything we do is as safe as it can be. During the course of my career, one of the positions I held was as the safety manager for the refinery. I remember once in that role, I took a tour of a U.S. refinery, and I shared my notes with my U.S. counterpart, a really colorful character named James Jeter. And he would say, call me Jeter. Everyone calls me Jeter. So that's what I had to call him. So Jeter had a wealth of knowledge and this no-nonsense practical approach. But when it came to the topic of safety, he would get very emotional. He asked me what motivated me as a safety manager. I told him, you know, I want to protect the workers, the plant, and the community. Make sure everyone gets home safely, that sort of thing. Jeter shook his head and told me, no, nope, Gil, that's, that's not good enough. He told me about an accident some years back at his facility, a fire in which there had been a fatality. It was Jeter's own brother. With tears welling up in his eyes, he told me, there isn't a day that goes by when I don't question if I could have done something different, something that would have saved my brother's life. He emphasized that safety has to be personal. To do a thorough job at ensuring safety, you have to have a personal reason, a personal focus for what you're doing. I took that message to heart. And when I returned home, we put more emphasis on personalizing safety with our own workers. And we challenged them to identify the name of a loved one to work safe for, and to remind themselves of the personal reasons for safety. One of our project engineers took it another step, and he created a hard hat sticker for his workers that read, I am working safe for blank for them to write in the name of that special person. And that's what we all need to do all the time in the engineering profession. We have to think, what if my son or daughter was driving over that bridge? What if my spouse was in that elevator? What if my mother or father was drinking that water? It's through this deep personal attention to public safety that we maintain that social license and public trust to which our profession depends. Okay, so far the qualities of an excellent engineer that we have discussed are humility, deference, and caution. Jeez, so far it sounds like I'm talking about a monk. But there's another quality that sets engineers apart, and that is vision. On every level, as individuals, as companies, and as a profession, we must always be striving for greater things. Certainly, that is something I experienced at the personal level, starting off as a laborer, working hard, studying hard, and finally achieving my dream of becoming an engineer. It's also something I've seen at the corporate level at Federated Co-op. I spent my, most of my adult life working for that refinery and I have to say I am very proud of it. Like a lot of things in Saskatchewan, I don't think we at the refinery take the time to talk about our history and to recognize the really remarkable things that we have achieved. This is a history that goes back to the 1930s, to the heart of the Depression, not exactly the heyday of entrepreneurial initiative. 
Saskatchewan farmers had long since learned the benefits of establishing co-ops to make joint purchases of inputs. As farmers used more and more fuel in their operations, it was a natural move to set up a chain of co-op fuel centers all across the province. But those co-ops faced supply challenges. First, the Canadian government imposed a steep tariff on gasoline imported from the U.S. The co-ops turned to small independent refineries, but they didn't remain independent for long. Soon the major oil companies started buying up all those small refineries. And then they used this increased leverage to raise prices. The bold response by the co-ops was to launch a drive to build their own refinery. Can you imagine, in the midst of the worst economic catastrophe in modern history, in the face of a devastating drought, with many farmers turning their cars into Bennett buggies, and in a watershed moment, a group of progressive farmers decide to build a refinery. One farmer put up the title to his farm, there was a fundraising drive, and they raised a total of $32,000. But in the first year of operation, that refinery had sales of $235,000. That facility went from 500 barrels a day in 1935, just enough to supply part of Saskatchewan, to today. It's a major Western Canadian supplier producing 130,000 barrels a day. That's an incredible story of vision and perseverance. But it's not a unique one. Saskatchewan's history is full of those sorts of tales, of achievements, and mainly engineering-driven achievements that have allowed us to grow from one of the poorest provinces to one of the richest. I just saw an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago in which uh, a CIBC economist, they were doing an analysis on the downturn in oil and gas and how that would affect Alberta and Saskatchewan. The long and the short of the article was that it will hit Alberta harder than it's going to hit Saskatchewan. Our economy has benefited from being diversified through what I once heard called the three F's, food, fuel, and fertilizer. And each one of those has depended on the world-class contributions of Saskatchewan engineers. On the food side, we have conquered drought cycles for much of the province through the construction of Gardner Dam and Lake Diefenbaker by the PFRA in the 1960s. It was, by and large, Saskatchewan engineers who created those awesome facilities. And those Saskatchewan boys, fellows like Robert Peterson and Stu Ringham, their skills and their work was world class. In Peterson's case, his next job after building Gardner was working on the Hoover Dam. You look at that area today, Lake Diefenbaker, Gardner Dam, Douglas Park, they're all named after politicians. And I guess that's just the way it goes. But amongst ourselves, let's not forget, the politicians dream it, but it's the engineers who help to make those great things happen. And you can see that same sort of achievement on the mechanical engineering side at organizations like PAMI that have revolutionized farm technology, not only in Saskatchewan, but around the world. Here in Saskatchewan, we have set the standard for dry land farming technology to which the rest of the world aspires. And the same goes for the mining sector for all the wealth our province has reaped from potash and uranium. Saskatchewan engineers have developed techniques in ground freezing and jet boring 
that have allowed us to access greater reserves of our resources than we could have ever dreamed of in past decades. So you see, in one area after another, the story of Saskatchewan's success has been the story of our success as a profession. As I said, vision is a natural part of being an engineer. It's the North Star that guides us. We engineers do tremendous things. We change the courses of rivers. We build electrical plants that power entire cities. We find new ways to get oil and gas out of the ground. As humble as we are about ourselves, we're all ambitious to achieve that next great thing. If we didn't have those ambitions, I don't think we'd be in this profession. But if you've ever wondered, can I achieve those great things here in Saskatchewan? Can I have a world-class career in the middle of the prairies? I'm here to tell you that yes, you can. Just as countless other engineers before you have astounded the world from within the borders of this province, so can you. Saskatchewan has not yet reached its full potential, and we will need every young engineering mind that we can get to help grow even further. There's an old story that I would like to share with you tonight before I conclude here. Uh, an old man was walking on a shore littered with thousands and thousands of starfish, beached and dying after a storm. A young man was picking them up one at a time and then flinging them back into the ocean. The old man stopped and asked the young man, why do you bother? You're not saving enough to make a difference. The young man reached down and picked up another starfish and sent it spinning back to the water. Then he turned and looked at the old man and said, made a difference to that one. And that is what every engineer, young and old, has to keep in mind throughout your career. No matter what your scope of practice, no matter what your job or task, make a difference. That, above all else, is what the profession of engineering calls us to do. Thank you. What a wonderful and encouraging Made in Saskatchewan story. I'm just going to get you to stay here just for a few moments. I now have the further pleasure of inviting Professor D.Y. Pang, head of the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the U of S, to present a gift to our distinguished lecturer. Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I think I may have the best job this evening, and that is to present a gift in appreciation of our distinguished lecturer and <coughs> Mr. Gilbert Lidrash. I'm especially pleased as Gilbert was a student of mine when he studied in the College of Engineering some 26 years ago. Perhaps I cannot take too much credit, but it is gratifying as professors to see our students go on to achieve success. I'm happy to see you here and with your lovely wife and lovely daughter, and also your brother. I think it's a, I, we are very proud of you. So, I, should be, I would like to be 
able to thank and congratulate you and your lecture and for being the third, the 2015 C.J. McKenzie Distinguished Lecture. I'm very pleased to present you as gift as a token of our appreciation for your lecture.